Hi, welcome to this lesson on the evidence for evolution. So the first thing I want to start with is just to show you this picture again uh, and ask you to remember what does this diagram show? What type of diagram is this and what kind of evidence is used to construct it? Write those answers down and then I'll give you the answers in just a sec. So the diagram is what's called um, a phylogenetic tree and it shows the three domain classification system. So we build this kind of tree, this map showing evolutionary relationships by looking at mainly molecular evidence, which includes DNA, um, the protein cytochrome C, and also the DNA that codes for it, and also the 16S ribosomal RNA, which is a key component of the uh, small subunit of the ribosome. And we covered that in last lesson, so if, you, if you're not familiar with this, you need to go back and have a look at the previous lesson, which is all about phylogenetics. So we're talking about this again because phylogenetics and molecular evidence forms part of the evidence for the theory of evolution, the wider theory of evolution. And we're going to be looking at other evidence for that theory today. First thing that I want to recap on is just that we've already looked at a lot of molecular evidence for evolution in the previous lesson about phylogenetics. But let's look at the main points again. So all organisms on uh, our planet have DNA and RNA as the genetic material. So that in itself is a similarity and suggests that we all came from one uh, shared ancestor. The genetic code is universal. So if you have three base pairs, let's say the triplet AUG, in pretty much all organisms that will code for the amino acid methionine. So the code is universal. ATP is also universally used as a molecule for um, energy storage, or maybe you might call it the energy currency of the cell. The proteins in all organisms all use the same 20 amino acids. There's other amino acids that we don't use, so why is it that all life shares just those 20? All life forms have phospholipid-type membranes, and there's also many, many shared metabolic processes. Uh, for example, respiration uh, is the same in many, many organisms that suggests that we all came from a common ancestor. So that's the molecular evidence for evolution, but there's not just molecular evidence, there's other types of evidence. So I'm just gonna jump back here and look at the man who came up with the theory of evolution. Well, actually we credit Charles Darwin with the theory, but it's also very important to recognize the contribution of Alfred Wallace, as both Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace proposed the theory of natural selection around about a similar time, and they came to these theories independently working um, you know um, just in this almost in the same country I think one was in Scotland one was in the UK um, and they both came to the same conclusion so what was the evidence that they were looking at well first of all in brief let's look at the main categories so Darwin and Wallace were able to look at living species and see relationships between those more on that in a second they were able to look at fossils and see relationships between those. Again, more on that in a few minutes. They were able to compare the anatomy between various different um, organisms and see that actually things as, as different as a bird, a human, and a lizard all shared common bone structure, for example. And then they were also able to uh, recognize that evolution could occur in human sort of lifespans by the controlled breeding of animals. So this artificial selection, for example, has created many dog breeds, and that was evidence that organisms could change through controlling of breeding. But let's go into one of those um, forms of evidence that Darwin had in a bit more detail. So Darwin is most famous for his voyages to the Galapagos Islands and his discover well, his, his thinking about the theory of evolution whilst he was there and actually after he was there when he was reflecting on his experiences. So where are the Galapagos Islands? Well, here they are. This is a map uh, showing a bunch of places that I uh, stayed last year. I was very fortunate enough to go to the Galapagos last year. Uh, and they're right here. So this is about 600 miles away from the coast of Ecuador. And the reason that's so important is because it's a very, very long way from, from the mainland. So it's very difficult for animals to get from the mainland of Ecuador to the Galapagos Islands, but it does happen extremely infrequently. You know, once every, I don't know how many years, few hundred or few thousand years, some animals have been swept up, and then once they've arrived at the coast uh, of the Galapagos, they've started to change, they've started to evolve. So, on the Galapagos Islands, we've got a lot of finches, okay? These are some of the finches that Darwin categorized when he was on the Galapagos Islands, and he started to wonder why are there so many birds that are very similar, except they have slightly different beaks. 
Um, how, do, how do they all come to be so sort of similar looking, but have different ways of feeding and, and different beaks? And he just, he just was perplexed by this. Later on, when we're reflecting on this and coming up with his theory, he recognized that all these birds evolved from one ancestral species. So this might have been a bird that got uh, swept across to the Galapagos Islands in a freak storm, for example, many, many thousands of years ago. And then when that bird landed on the Galapagos, it started to kind of split into different populations, uh, focusing on different types of food and different ecological niches. And then evolution occurred to kind of adapt the beak. And we're going to look at the mechanisms for that in the, in the later lesson. Okay, so that's the Galapagos. More about the Galapagos. Uh, I did a little animation here for you. I hope you like it. So the Galapagos Islands have a predominant um, weather direction, and it comes from the west, and the rainfall sweeps in from the west. And the other thing is that the rainfall hangs around on the bigger islands, the more mountainous islands, for longer. Uh, and the islands to the east, they get less rainfall. So that basically means that this island of Isabella and Fernandina, and also these two big islands, they're all fairly reasonably wet. They've got rainfall, they've got um, some standing water. Whereas these smaller islands, they're a lot less high uh, and they don't have much rainfall. They're very dry, almost desert-like. So the tortoises, which the Galapagos are famous for, are different on these different islands. So if we kind of shrink that map a bit and replace it with this one, this now shows how different tortoises on these different islands have different shapes of uh, shell. So the Isabella tortoise is like this, and we can see it has a shell that is kind of fairly sort of rounded at the front as a sort of uh, a tortoise that is adapted for a wetter climate. Now, this tortoise up here has a very, very different shape set shell. Uh, and it's called the saddleback tortoise, and it's got this massive saddle, I guess, this massive uh, kind of V-shape at the front of the shell. And the reason it has that is because that enables it to stretch its neck up um, quite high, like, like shown here, to reach... Um, sort of uh, cactus fruit when it's very uh, dry. So it's, they're almost kind of like a, like a giraffe of a tortoise world, if you like. Uh, and here you can see sort of two, I think, male tortoises here having a bit of a fight. Uh, and these are the um, saddleback tortoises from drier islands. So Darwin recognised this, and in, in fact, he would have known from the, from the locals uh, on the island at the time that um, you could tell which island a tortoise came from just by looking at the shape of its shell. So this was another thing that led him to think about evolution. Okay, so the next thing that Darwin obviously uh, would have had to form his theory of evolution is fossils. So a fossil is the remains of an animal or plant that's been turned to rock or mineralized. Uh, and Darwin was certainly a, a fan of looking at these fossils. So uh, I've got a few myself, so I just thought I'd show them to you. So first of all, this one. This one is actually a fossilized um, mammoth's tooth. So these are ridges of dentine sort of here, uh, and the mammoth tooth was very sort of tough, almost like two uh, fists with kind of ridges like this, and they would grind material up like this. So that's a, a mammoth tooth fossil. There you go. Um, the next one, one of my favorites, is this. This is a, actually a megalodon tooth. Uh, you can imagine the size of the shark with that as a tooth. Uh, absolutely enormous. It's still pretty sharp actually. It's got kind of ridges there. I don't know if you can see that fine ridges there. Uh, you could still probably chop some vegetables with that. Um, and this one, a bit more difficult to see. Maybe you can't really see it, but it, it, it's actually got a bit of a sort of honeycomb structure, if you can see that there. And this is actually a dinosaur bone. So inside here is the kind of um, bone marrow of the dinosaur bone. So three fossils there um, for you to look at. Not only do we have fossils, but we also find fossils in the rock layers in an order. So here, uh, I'm just going to take you through a few stages in the evolution of uh, a horse. So millions of years ago, the horse ancestor was called a hierocotherium, uh, and it looked a bit like this. It had five toes that spread its way out on the ground. And then, as uh, the marshes dried out, there was a climate change, marshes dried out, it became faster to kind of run on three toes, a bit like this. Um, this process of faster animals surviving, passing on their genes, uh, happened more and more, and then the horses started to run on sort of just one toe like this, with two smaller toes either side, and eventually this single toe became a hoof. So today's modern horse is really actually kind of 
running on just one fingernail, really, but very adapted over millions of years. So when we look at the rock layers, we find the fossils that tell us this information in a regular pattern. And we can join up the fossils and chart the, the evolution of organisms through time. So we've covered quite a few of the, of the major parts of evidence for evolution. Um, but I want you, there's the timelines there, sorry. But I want you now to have a look at this video, which is a fantastic video, which summarizes all the information we've looked at. So called, what is the evidence for evolution? I'll put the hyperlink underneath the video description. And I'd like you to make some notes on this video in this format. So put a little mind map like this about the evidence for evolution. And this video splits the evidence into these categories. So we've got um, comparative anatomy, we sort of looked at that already, embryology, so what sort of embryos look like as they're developing in the womb, fossil record, we've touched on that already, DNA comparisons, we've looked at that quite a lot last lesson, species distribution, so that's where different species are situated uh, on the planet. We can actually observe evolution happening, like for example, artificial selection, and even in bacteria, we can see uh, evolution very, very quickly occurring. We can make predictions um, using evolution and see if they are correct. And we can also sort of look at hierarchies of traits. Now this kind of means that, for example, all primates, although the primates differ on a species to species level, they have shared features um, that kind of uh, suggest that all primates evolved from one ancestor, and one of those is five fingers. So, have a look at this video, fill out a mind map like this, it might take a whole page of your book, uh, and then you can send the evidence of that to me uh, via Teams. Okay, pause this video, go watch that one, and then come back to this for a clean room. Okay, so hopefully you found that video to be as fascinating as I did. Um, really, really interesting one there, and now let's just make sure that we understand everything that we need to with a bit of a plenary. So here are five questions uh, taken from your textbook. So read over your textbook page on this uh, topic. Sorry, I forgot the textbook page, but I'm sure you'll be able to work it out. Um, pause the video, and then we'll come back and green pen the answers. Okay, pause the video now. Okay, have you done that? Let's have a look at the answers. So here you go. Green pen those uh, questions. Make sure that you are including keywords. If there's key vocabulary here that you didn't use, for example, characteristics, protein structures, that sort of thing, then do add in those keywords and send me uh, evidence of that on Teams, please. Finally, before we go, as always, we're going to have a little look at a syllabus to check that we can do what we should be able to do. So in the syllabus, it says that you should be aware of the evidence for the theory of evolution by natural selection. And this is to include the contributions of Darwin and Wallace in formulating the theory of evolution by natural selection and the fact you've got fossil evidence, DNA evidence. So we talked about um, mitochondrial DNA and chromosomal DNA. So that's just a little bit at A level you need to remember about the mitochondrial maternally inherited DNA uh, and other molecular evidence by looking, for example, at comparing different proteins, uh, how many different amino acids are there, let's say, in the cytochrome C protein between two different species. So that's the syllabus uh, for the evidence for evolution. And next lesson, we're going to be starting to kind of unpick how evolution works. We're going to start by looking at variation next lesson, and then we're going to go into natural selection and looking at a little bit of mathematics also to do with analyzing variation. Okay, so see you next lesson. Thanks.